I would say since you're here in uh, New York City, in May, you may want to think of attending the session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Um, it's May 16th to the 27th at UN headquarters. Um, you would probably register around the beginning of January. Um, but you would do your homework as to the issues that you would want to look at, the meetings that you would want to attend, um, and maybe be able to use the opportunity to speak to the government uh, representatives that will be attending, and Ecuador is always there. So that would be my suggestion. Uh, just very briefly to follow up with what Tanya said, one of the things that, that didn't really come across very well in the uh, in the film is the other things that happen in the forum. Yes, the forum makes these form, you know, had issues its reports, which contains a number of recommendations that go to the UN system and to the member states. But also, what happens, and that's one of the reasons why indigenous activists fought for the establishment of the forum for decades, was they access, and they wanted this. That's why it's called the permanent forum because they wanted permanent, and they wanted it in New York because they wanted to have access because that's where the uh, that's where. The, you have the base, that's where the headquarters of so many of these UN agencies are. So actually what happens during these sessions, yes, you have the main formal meeting going on, but there are so many small closed door meetings happening where uh, re indigenous representatives are meeting with people that are in charge of big offices, that are heads of, the, of departments or uh, sections of the UN agencies that can, so that can generally, genuinely have an effect on how these UN agencies are, are behaving back in their home countries. That's one. They also have access to the uh, representatives of their government. So often people that cannot reach their government, their government back home in their country, they come to New York in the forum, and then finally they can speak to somebody from their government. And that's also a criticism that's been uh, laid at UN agencies as well, that the UN agencies often uh, are, have some staff that aren't very sensitive to the needs and to the issues that indigenous peoples are dealing with. So. They can't. They knock on the doors, and the doors are closed in the home country. But they can have access to their bosses that are at, in New York. So there are these things. And it's practical and it's real, and people actually do take advantage of this. Thanks. First, I wanted to welcome you all here tonight to share with us your knowledge and your work, the great work that you're doing within this organization that I had no inkling that even existed before this evening, and uh, I would like to find out if we could get some copies of this film if we don't have it for our library. And I also would like to see this program continue the way the UN Ambassadors program has been so successful here. And maybe uh, there are even ways that maybe student organizations could, if they were interested, uh, think of ways to fund these people that have to get from their countries to these meetings where you know, money is such a problem. And, uh, oh God, there's so much I wanted to say. But first, uh, I, most of it is just comments, and there is one question. Uh, I've always believed that the health of the indigenous peoples of the world was a good barometer of the health of our planet in general. And like this film illustrated so well, that in areas where there's increased or greater biodiversity, it's usually because there's indigenous peoples have been the caretaker of that land for so long. And uh, it's a little bit disheartening to be from a country that is doing so, it always seems to be dragging their feet when it comes to issues like bees. Uh, I think it's maybe because they have such a horrendous issue in dealing with the, the indigenous peoples of their own country for so many hundreds of years that they're still kind of in this denial stage. And it's, I agree with this gentleman who spoke earlier that it's only when governments start to see that we're all interconnected and interrelated. and these uh, lines between countries that only exist in someone's mind are, will disappear eventually uh, if this planet is to survive, I think. And all the people will have to learn how to 
live uh, and let others live. And the one question that I have is, has anyone ever brought up the issue of overpopulation within, within this organization? Because it seems to be all these little pockets of indigenous peoples where they have at least remained their autonomy to a certain degree, even though they have been so decimated over the years. Uh, they seem to be like under siege from the greed of, you know, the multinationals and governments. And I was wondering if the problem of uh, overpopulation, which seems to be at the root of all these problems, has been addressed by this organization. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful comments. I think I agree with everything you've said, absolutely. Um, when you talk about overpopulation, um, what what the what the permanent form has looked at uh, clearly, and other UN agencies has been how urban sprawl um, has affected and is affecting indigenous communities, and how it is squeezing indigenous communities, not only uh, land, but also resources. Right. It, it, um, it comes in and takes out the resources that indigenous peoples are relying on. So that's one. But what we also find is because indigenous people sit on resources, they are being removed from their lands um, under the guise of various, uh, for various reasons. Um, in the United States, this has been a policy, this has been law that has been going on for um, quite a long time. Uh, you have the Indian Reorganization Act, you have the Termination Act. These are laws that were issued in the 1950s that legally removed Native peoples from their indigenous communities and put Native peoples in urban centers under the guise that there would be jobs, um, health, facilities, and education waiting for them. And in some instances, some Native peoples had to sign promises that they would not return back to their communities, that they would stay in those urban centers. Now, removal is all about making that land more available for taking. So, when when you're when the uh, when a country is expanding, such as the United States, such as other countries, whether they're developed or developing, they're going to be looking for more land and they're going to be looking for resources. And what indigenous peoples have be, that make indigenous peoples indigenous are those two things. We have land, and on that land we have resources, whether it's water, timber, coal, oil, tar sands, you name it, we have those resources. As long as indigenous peoples have land and resources, we will have this fight. We will always have this fight no, because we have that. We have those lands and resources. When those lands and resources are gone, um, that particular fight will be over. And the shift will be, in, in my humble opinion, more of a minority's approach to indigenous peoples, rather than a peoples from a particular place. So this is why it is so important for indigenous peoples to hold on to our indigenous places. Um, and it's a struggle. The indigenous peoples here in New Jersey will tell you what a struggle that is.